Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Now let's join together in singing, Celebrate Jesus, Celebrate. wonder of Easter is that we can hear the message again and again and it's still good news as good and true and relevant as it was the first time we heard it when we heard it really heard it and took it in as good and true and relevant as it is this morning it will continue to be the greatest good news tomorrow the day after till the end of time. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Eternal God, we thank you that Easter is not just about something that happened so long ago, but has real relevance right now. Thank you that it's not just about others 2,000 years ago, but about us. It's not just about some part of our lives, but about every aspect of our lives. Thank you that Easter means we can celebrate the victory of good over evil, love over hate, life over death, the turning of weakness into strength, fear into courage, doubt into faith, a new beginning when everything seemed at an end, hope where there'd been despair, confidence where there'd been confusion. Help us all to live each day as though every day is a cause for celebration. Every day a reason for joy to bubble up within our hearts every day for laughter to shine from our eyes, every day a time for sharing its good news, 
every day the day to have its message on our lips. And this is our real prayer today, God, that others may see in us the difference Easter has made for us and discover for themselves the difference it can make for them. This we pray because of Jesus and in his name. Amen. And now, and we'll have a little bit of time with young people. Morning, Charlie. I hope you're feeling happy this morning because it's Easter Day. Last Sunday when I talked to you, we were celebrating Jesus as a king on a donkey and that was a happy day. And then Friday, we felt sad because Jesus died on the cross. Now today, we're happy again because it's Easter Day and Jesus is alive. But I wonder whether you're happy because the Easter Bunny came to you this morning. Did the Easter Bunny come and leave you some eggs? I've got a bunny and an egg here with me this morning. But do you know, I was reading in my Bible the story of Easter Day and there was no talk of bunnies and there was no talk of eggs. So how come... On Easter Day, when we talk about Jesus coming alive, do we also talk about bunnies and eggs? That's a bit funny, isn't it? Well, do you know, in another part of the world, it's springtime. And at springtime, lots of new things come alive. Baby ducks and chickens and birds hatch out of eggs. Rabbits have lots of babies at springtime. And somehow or other, we've got it all mixed up together and we've got springtime and baby bunnies and eggs and Jesus coming alive all mixed up together. But I don't think that matters because that makes us happy. And this is such a happy day because Jesus is alive. So I hope you have a happy time. Don't eat too many chocolate eggs or too many chocolate bunnies. I can tell by your face that you've got some. And do you know that sometimes we can look at an egg as a bit like the shape of a cave where they put Jesus' body. And when it was opened up, Jesus wasn't in it. And sometimes when we open our chocolate eggs, there's nothing inside them too. All of those things help us remember Today's a happy day because Jesus is alive. Hooray for that. And Janet will now bring us our reading for today. Thank you, Janet. Our reading today is from John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together. But the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. <clears throat> Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. He also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. It wasn't with the other clothes, but was folded up in its own place. Then the other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels 
dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot. The angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? She replied, They have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've put him. As soon as she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me, <clears throat> for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them, I'm going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the, to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And then she told them what he said to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Only yesterday, I came across something and I have some doubts about it, but I thought I'd share it with you anyway. And this was, as we heard, the women went into the tomb and the cloth that had been over Jesus' head was folded. And this explanation was given, that a servant always did exactly as was expected of them. And in this case, at a meal, when the master had finished his meal, he took the cloth and threw it on the floor. And the servant knew that he had to collect the cloth. But if the master was going to come back to the table, the cloth was folded. And in this interpretation, it's a sign that Jesus is coming back. I'll leave to you whether you believe that that's really the interpretation that the first disciples of Jesus understood by those words in John's version of the story. Now we sing one of my favourite Easter hymns, Lift high the cross, the cross of Christ the love of Christ proclaim till all the world adore his sacred name.
live at a time when Easter is derided by some who say they're Christian and make it sound as though Jesus' resurrection is just a parable of the way we can rise again from any desperate situation. Others liken the cross to an electric chair or hangman's noose just as an instrument of death and talk about it as representing the pain and suffering to be expected when injustice is opposed. Others would have it that the cross means that just as Jesus gave his life for others, we should give ourselves as sacrificially as he did. Such interpretations may be part of Easter's meaning, but misunderstand the full biblical teaching about the cross and Easter. The cross is much more than an object lesson in how we can or ought to live, and much more than some form of painful suffering in the fight against evil and devilry. In the middle of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, the main character, Rodion Raskolnikov, brutally murders an elderly pawnbroker and moneylender, Alyona Ivanovna, when Ivanovna's half-sister, Lizaveta, stumbles across the scene, he murders her as well. Raskolnikov later meets a young woman, Sonia, compelled by poverty to become a prostitute to support her family. He's drawn to her, and after he learns that Lizaveta had been friends with Sonia, feels compelled to confess the murders to her. Finally, he musters up the courage, but his confession is indirect. Sonia has to work out that he, Raskolnikov, is Lizaveta's murderer. When that dawns on her, she jumps up, seemingly not knowing what she's doing, and wringing her hands, walks into the middle of the room, turns quickly, and sits down beside him, their shoulders almost touching. Suddenly, she jumps up as though she's been stabbed, utters a cry, and falls on her knees. What have you done? What have you done to yourself? She cries in despair and jumps up, flings herself on his neck, throws her arms around him and holds him tightly. Raskolnikov is not the only one who's shocked by Sonia's gesture. The reader is as well. What is going on? Why is Sonia embracing this murderer in a fit of compassion? When she next speaks, she cries out in a frenzy. There's no one, no one in the whole world now so unhappy as you. And breaks into violent, hysterical weeping. Dostoevsky meant us to see there his understanding of the meaning of the cross and the mysterious nature of God, the God he'd begun to understand. Jesus didn't consider the glory of divinity something to exalt in. He'd taken on human nature in all its bliss and tragedy. He showed he was not only a man of sorrows, but a God who has borne our griefs. Not merely a man wounded for our transgressions, but a God bruised for our iniquities. Jesus 
knew the shameful sin of humankind. The cross is the sign of his violent, hysterical weeping for us. But we need to be careful. We need the full picture, both in crime and punishment and in what the Bible tells us. Sonia's love violently weeps for Raskolnikov and for those he murdered, insisting he repent before God and the whole world. She demands he turn himself in and endure justice. When Jesus dies on the cross, he does so not only in compassion for us, for our sin, but in fierce judgment against sin. In his ministry, Jesus from time to time became angry with sin, especially hardness of heart and hypocrisy. In John's Jesus story, we're told that the wrath of God remains on those who reject Christ. Wrath? Anger? The fact that it took Jesus, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, to die for sin means sin is a problem of immense significance. Not to be dismissed with a divine wave of the hand. The judgment against sin is not merely severe. It's a judgment grounded in anger that weeps. It's a search for justice that's framed by compassion, by a wrath driven by love. The complex and mysterious nature of God is such that sin causes God to grab us around the neck and weep hysterically. God knows what sin has done to us, knows the tragic sadness that overshadows us. This sadness is not merely a negative emotion and feeling of shame. It's closer to depression, permeating every cubic centimetre of our bodies through and through. It's like a cancer eating away at us till nothing's left. That's what sin does. That's why a loving creator weeps. Ultimately, however, a weeping God does us little good. Sympathy, we appreciate, but we need more than sympathy. The cross is not only a sign of God's compassion for us, but also of God's commitment to us. In the confession scene in Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky notes Raskolnikov's stunned reaction. Then you won't leave me, Sonia, he said, looking at her almost with hope. No, no, never, nowhere cries Sonia. I will follow you. I will follow you everywhere. Later, Raskolnikov talks Sonia out of accompanying him to Siberia, the place of judgment and exile, the symbol of suffering and desolation. Sonia responds by giving him a cross to wear, while she wears one herself and says, We'll go to suffer together. Together we will bear our cross. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. 
the yoke, of course, is a crossbar with two U-shaped pieces of wood that fits over the necks of a pair of oxen or mules or other draft animals working in a team. Jesus here pictures himself as accompanying us in the yoke, but bearing the full weight of the burden. That's why his yoke is easy and the burden light, because on the cross he shouldered it all, making himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. When Paul tells us to carry another's burdens, that way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. He's not putting some new religious obligation on our backs. No, the law of Christ is here just the way things work. Carry each other's burdens because that's the secret of the universe. That's the way reality works. That's how the creator of reality operates day in and day out. Jesus calls us to take up our cross, but the full weight of the cross-beamed yoke is borne by him. The God who sorrows for our sins, the man who bears our griefs. This is the Lord and Saviour who promises to never leave or forsake us and who helps to shoulder the burdens life with him invariably seems to involve, especially when life journeys take us to difficult and desolate places. Discover the meaning of the cross and Easter becomes full of joy and hope Accept that Jesus rose in part an affirmation that God has acted in a new way. And in acting in a new way, God has opened new possibilities in life. Possibilities that overarch death. Possibilities to be shared with everybody, everywhere, in God's renewed Easter world. Amen. This morning, rather than being able to celebrate Holy Communion, we'll be sharing together in a love feast. And a love feast was a much more easygoing celebration of the life of Jesus, emphasizing love. And in the traditional way that a love feast was revived in the time of John Wesley, it became a time for sharing the experience of Christ with one another. But first, let's share the peace with each other. And let's do that, as we've suggested over the last few weeks, by thinking at this time of somebody with whom you'd normally shake hands or share a, a hug or even a kiss. Somebody from within the congregation. Not the same person as you've shared it with before, but somebody new. And later after the service, maybe you can go and have a, a cuppa, pick up the phone and ring that particular person and share with them. So that as we begin to do this, we share across the weeks that this lockdown may involve with most members of the congregation. So let me say, the peace of the Lord be with you.
A reading from Luke's Gospel. When the two disciples and the stranger came to Emmaus, he gave the impression that he was going further, but they urged him not to. Oh, stay with us, they said. It's nearly evening. The day's almost gone. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, <coughs> weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? They got up, got up right there and then and headed back to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. The Lord be with you. Let's give thanks. Let's pray. Almighty God, it is right that always and everywhere we thank you for your goodness and your love. You give food and drink to all humankind for our delight and enjoyment, so that we may praise and bless you even in days of trouble. Be present with us as we eat and drink. As Jesus asked us to eat and drink in remembrance of him, may we be aware that Jesus is present with us whenever we receive our food with glad and generous hearts. Remember your church and bring us to a time when we may gather once again around your table in the fellowship of our congregation. For yours is the power and glory forever. Amen. And I'm not quite sure how well prepared you are, but maybe you care to, as it were, join us because all of the team here will come around this table. They'll pour themselves a drink, and it's not grape juice, it's not wine, it's just juice. And we have a variety of foods here. I've chosen to take some very ordinary flat bread, rather like the bread Jesus would have used at the Last Supper with his disciples. Of course, at the Passover, there was to be no yeast, and so this flat bread is much more like the bread Jesus would have used for that Last Supper. And that, to me, is what I've chosen for this morning. Others may choose differently. And I'm going to be eating off screen while others come forward and do the same. Because this has been silent, it sounds though it's been a, a fairly solemn time together. But originally with the love feast, it was a time for celebration and happiness and joy. And what I'm going to suggest, if it's possible, and I think it is, is that one or two of you might like to share something of your experience of Christ and what Christ and Easter has meant for you. I always go back to a time 
which is stuck in my memory. It wasn't Easter, it was Christmas. I was at, on a train with fellow students from the United Theological College, Bangalore. We were in a compartment and there in the compartment with us was one other person wearing a turban, a Sikh. And we were a little wary because Sikhs have the reputation of being militant, despite the fact that as we've discovered in Australia, many of them are very kind people. But it was this Sikh who paused and said to us, you must be very happy today. It's Jesus' birthday. As I said, a moment I've never forgotten. Perhaps those of you watching electronically might like to share something of your own experience. We'll see. Go ahead, Ann. I just want to say how I love Easter because I met John at an Easter camp at Wilson's prom many, 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 many years ago. So Easter's always special to me. <laughs> if there's nobody else, we'll come back in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for the gifts of cake, biscuit, bread that we have received. Grant that we may share all of your gifts by loving and serving others. Let your church, now gathered around many tables on this resurrection day, remember our fellowship with all the saints. Soon and very soon, let us meet again as a gathered congregation to share in Holy Communion with our sisters and brothers and wait for that day when you gather us all to sit at table with you in paradise. Amen. Directed. Thank you. We celebrate your victory over death, over all the powers that would defeat us. Help us to grasp resurrection, to understand its power, to see its force at work in our world, overturning evil empires, changing the hatred within us, moving the world slowly, forcefully, bending us towards love and truth. On this day of great gladness, empower us to be your ambassadors proclaiming the good news. Good news in our kitchens and living rooms. Good news in our offices and workplaces. Good news in our online communities. Help us to be that good news, walking softly on this good earth, caring gently for all people, living hopefully in your kingdom. Today we think of all who are grieving and for the sick and dying, for places in the world that are struggling to cope with COVID-19. In this world of broken hopes and dreams, we catch sight of your kingdom come in the person of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns in us forever. Amen. And finally, we come together with a song which I gather could be new to you, but is quite simple. And I'll give you the words so that even though they're on screen, they are 
He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. this Easter day our prayer is that Christ shall be real to you real in every moment of your lives wherever you may be whatever you may be doing whatever you may be thinking Christ will be with you with all whom you love and with this whole world in this time of crisis and the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds safe and secure in the knowledge and love of God and the blessing of God Father Son and Holy Spirit be yours today and forever Amen <laughs>